Thank you. What a great day. If you missed me last week, or if you were skipping, if you were skipping church, you didn't even. If, if you were skipping church last week, you didn't even know I was gone. So, like some are skipping this week and don't even know I'm back. So, uh, yes, I watched online last week. So, just thought I'd tell you. Uh, God's good. We got to spend the entire week. Um, with each other, obviously, Angel and I, but we got to, um, we, we got to be in the Lord's presence a lot, and um, just, it was really good. We needed that. Uh, God's so good. And Luke chapter 9, I, I want to share a few things out of my heart today and speak to you a little bit as the father of the house. Um, I know the Bible says, don't call any man father. Um, I, I, I did get in trouble one time. Uh, my, you know, when I, when I was in high school, I went to public high school when I first, my first year of school, and then I got transferred to a Catholic high school. Um, my mom and dad had sympathy on me and sent me there really to, I played basketball to, for the school. And so I went to Catholic high school. And, um, so I, I went, I don't even know if they remember me doing this, but I made an appointment with the principal at the Catholic high school. And I, and I went in there and um, I said, I don't believe I should be taking theology here any longer. And, and the uh, principal said, he was Irish Catholic, Father Bolin, and he asked me why, why was that? And I said, well, because I, I don't believe like you guys believe, and I don't believe that I should have to sit and be taking these classes and you're teaching me things I don't believe. And he said, well, what is one of those things that you don't believe? And, and I said, well, one of them is we got to call you guys Father. And the Bible very clearly says, call no man father. What do you do with that? Uh, that was, anyway, he, he was real gracious to me. Uh, I didn't get kicked out. He didn't call my parents. <laughs> he, uh, he sent me back to class and, uh, and told me, you know, things will work out or whatever. I, I, whatever, but it was, uh, so when I say father of the house, I always think about that. But I believe that the kingdom looks like family and so we ought to, in a sense, we, we have that, and part of my role is, is, is a fatherly role, and so I want to fulfill that without being, you know, like, you know, have to, you don't have to call me father, please. <laughs> yeah. Actually, most kids who call their parents father and everything come like this. <laughs> yes, father. <laughs> so... Um, but I wanted, I've been, we've been talking a lot about discipleship over the last few uh, months, and I, I want to I talk to you about a couple things that are happening, okay? Like, it, towards the end of September, we are going to have a baptism here. We're going to have a baptism, a mass baptism. And if you've been baptized, I'm going to ask you to get rebaptized. I'm going to throw this out. We're going to have a baptism. We're going to do it. If you're, you're really old and you can't do it, we're going to have the ushers dip you in. Because I believe that, that God wants a renewal. God wants to do something. I want to be talking about the reason for that over the next couple of weeks. I'm going to. As we go in through September and into next week, we actually have a guest you won't want to miss next week, Dr. Pamela. I can't pronounce her last name. Uh, Easy Uzumaka. Okay. Um, Dr. Uh, Pamela will, uh, will be with us. She is... Um, one of the top, if not the top, um, archaeologists, doctor of archaeology for the University of Nigeria. She is one of the foremost scholars on archaeology for the continent of Africa. But the best thing that she's done that we know of, and she may have more, is she wrote a book on the Holy Spirit called Holy Spirit, My Best Friend. And it's an awesome book. It's an absolute awesome book. In fact, it's one of the books we use in school of ministry and reading. It's probably, I would say, to this point, the best book I've ever read on the Holy Spirit. And uh, she, we had the privilege. They called and said that she was available on that's this Sunday coming. And I, when Matt and I were in Nigeria, I always said to him, I'd love to have Dr. Pamela come to Hope. And so it just kind of dropped in our lap. So I got a phone call saying, you know, is, would, would you like to have Dr. Pamela or a text or something? It's like, yes. 
Christ. So uh, she'll be with us next Sunday, and you won't want to miss it because it's going to be uh, powerful. I'm sure she's not going to be sharing on the archaeological discoveries of the different artifacts that have been uncovered in the digs in, in, um, in Northern Africa. She is going to be releasing something in the spirit here that's going to be powerful and exciting in the kingdom. And so uh, it won't be dry and boring. She, uh, we actually had lunch with her, I believe. We sat and I, we talked to her about archaeology and, and, and all those things, and, but, but more so about what the Lord was doing because she's not one of them dry doctors. She is a dynamo. And so it's going to be great next week. But over the next couple of weeks, um, into the end of September, I'm going to be talking to you and teaching you on baptism and what it, what it is and, and all. Because one of the things we're going to be doing here is, is or let me say this, we, you can hear it in my messages, but we are going to be coming and we are becoming a discipleship-based church. Discipleship-based church. In other words, I believe to start off with that, that, that we are all called to be disciples. There's a difference. You, you can be a churchgoer and a disciple, but there's some people that are churchgoers that are not disciples. There's some people that just go to church. They kind of like be kind to God for an hour. Hopefully he'll still be with us and, and we live our lives. Most of the church, most of the church that I know in the Western culture lives, we, we claim to believe in God, but we live like practicing atheists. We live like there is no God. And that's got to change. If we're going to see our world change, it's got to change. And so we're going to have to, we're going to have to become disciples if we're not already. So we're going, we've been talking about what a disciple is. What a disciple is. What, what does it mean to, to be a disciple? What does it mean to give yourself over to the Lord? A disciple is a follower of, of a teacher. That's what a disciple is. Someone who follows and puts into practice the teachings of a teacher or a philosopher, or in this case, we're believe Jesus, not just a good teacher, but the Son of God. We become a disciple of this, of this great, this great God-man, Jesus. And, and that means we need to not just follow him from a distance, but we put into practice the things that he taught us. And that's so key to discipleship. And so I want to look at Luke here and just talk to you because I believe that part is my fault. And part of it is, is just the, 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 I'll take the blame, okay? I'll just take the blame. If, if I allow you to be a part of Hope Community and not become a disciple, then I've done a disservice to God and a disservice to you. We need to become disciples. We need to, to become deeper followers of the Lord. It's the calling that's gone out, that we would, we would go after Him. God is wanting to raise up an army, a last day army, that's sold out, radical, given over to the purposes of God. Not just people who attend church and live their lives. I've had, for the last couple of weeks, I've had a verse go through my head that has scared me. I'm not normally scared or given to fear that way or anything, but I've had just this verse that's put a fear in my heart, and it's this verse. It says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. That as the people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving to marriage, and did not know that the flood was coming, so shall it be. In the days, Jesus speaking, so shall it be in the day of the Son of Man. And this is my fear. What does it mean to be eating and drinking, marrying and giving to marriage? It means that the people had no discernment spiritually what was happening. They were living their lives, eating, drinking, marrying, giving to marriage. They were so consumed with life that they had no idea what was taking place spiritually around them. And Noah was building an ark and going into the ark and it was shutting and the flood was coming and the people just went just about their business. And I believe that a lot of us, we've been guilty of just doing our business and not, been, not giving ourselves over to the purposes and plan of God. Are you living for the purposes and plan of God for your life? Are you really a worshiper? Are you really one who's a disciple that's following the plans of God? Do we even know what God's plan is for our lives individually? Do we even know what God's plan is for us corporately? What are we here for? What's the purposes here? I hope we're not just marrying, giving to marriage, and, and you know, eating and drinking and doing our life, and then just kind of showing up for church when it's convenient. 
I believe God has something great for us. And it means us stepping up and stepping up our game. And it's time for that. I'm stepping up mine. And it's time for all of us. So I want to look at, at, at the book of Luke here. The end of Luke, chapter 9. And then we're going to go back to the story of the Samaritan woman, which I preached a couple of weeks ago. And we're going to go back and look at her. Um, Luke chapter 9, verse 57. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. There's three people that come to Jesus here, or three different disciples, possible disciples, and there's three reactions. So I'm going to read them all, then I'll talk to you. Verse 59, then he said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts their hand to the plow looks back and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Now at face value, some of this looks like Jesus is being a little hard and a little cruel. But let me just talk to you about all three cases and where we may fit in this. Because there's a litmus test on here to see whether or not we really are this, these disciples that are giving ourselves over to the Lord. Because I'm going to talk to you about worship in a few minutes and a life of worship. And then we're going to have the worship team come back. We're going to do communion. And we're going to give ourselves over to, to the Lord in, in, a, in an outward expression of worship. So the first one here, he says to Jesus, verse 57, I'll follow you wherever you go. Man, this is just like Sunday, old Sunday night at the altar. You know what I mean? Oh God, I give everything to you. I'm going to serve you. I'll go wherever you want me to. And Jesus says to him, there's a test. He says to him, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Jesus was testing this man to see how serious his commitment was. He said, you really want to follow me? I got no place to lay my head. I don't have a house. I have nothing to offer you. No place of comfort. No place. I have, I'm not going to offer you. I have nothing to offer you. You really want to follow me? Foxes even have their own dens. Birds have nests but I've got no place to lay my head. You're going to still follow me? How serious are we to follow the Lord? Would we follow him if he didn't give us anything? Would you serve the Lord if heaven wasn't promised to you? Would you serve the Lord if there wasn't a heaven or hell? Good question, isn't it? Because some of us, that's why we serve the Lord, just for eternal values. Going to get me some fire insurance. I got to stay close to Jesus because if not, I'll just die. I'll die and go to hell. I'll be, I'll be cast away. See, Jesus is saying, I'm not, would you follow me without me promising you anything? Because some people come to the altar, I'll serve you, Jesus, if you'll just heal my, my, my problem here. Oh, if you'll just come and meet my need, I'll give you everything, everything. And then what happens? God meets the need, and then we give him everything for about a month, and then we start pulling back and going back to right where we were. How serious are we about being a disciple? How serious do we really want to follow Jesus? But then there's another guy that comes here. He says to another man, now this is, this is the thing that gets me, Jesus, this guy doesn't come to Jesus, Jesus goes to this guy and says, come follow me. He did that with Matthew, the tax collector, he did that with Peter, he did that with Andrew, he did that with James and John, the sons of Zebedee. So Jesus comes to this guy, it doesn't tell us his name, it doesn't tell us anything, he just comes up to a man and said, come follow me. And the man makes an excuse. Look what he says. Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Now that, if you just take it in our, in our culture and our thinking, you're thinking this. The guy's dad just died and there's a funeral this week. 
And he's got to go take care of his father. And Jesus says to him, he's so cold. I mean, Jesus is so cold. Let the buried dead bury their own dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And you're saying, Jesus is telling this man not to go to his father's funeral. But that's not what was happening here. Jesus, this is what the man was saying. The man was saying this. I am the son of my father, and I have an inheritance from him. I'm going to go home. I'll follow you. But first, let me go home, live my life with my dad, live the life that he's given me, claim my inheritance, and when he dies 10, 15, 20 years, 30 years from now, when he dies and I get what's coming to me, then I'll come and serve you. And Jesus said, if that's where you are, see, this is a test. This is the man's thing here. He says, he's saying, you can't be just a casual disciple. Where are your priorities? You can't just be this casual follower of Jesus. Today I feel it. Oh, tomorrow I don't. I'm going to feel, I feel like serving him today. I feel really good. I got up this morning. I'm decided I'm going to worship the Lord today. And, but tomorrow I may not feel like it. I may not feel like it. I might just, I, I, I don't feel my, my uh, whatever it may be, uh, my hormones are up and down. My, my physical feelings are up and down. My, my problems are, are weighty and I just can't do it. I, I, I just know. He's saying, I'm looking for somebody that will come follow me no matter what and give up the ties and the things that would hold them back. For obviously this man wanted his inheritance more than he wanted to follow Jesus. He wanted what his father could give him more than he wanted what, what, what this relationship with Christ would give him. And Jesus said, listen, let the dead bury their own. Get out of that system. Get out of that type of thinking and come follow me. I think we're too casual the way we serve Jesus. We worship whether we feel like it or not. I've actually said to people in the church sometimes, would you just come in, come towards the front and enter into worship? I remember what I used to do a, um, like a small group. Todd was part of it back a ways. There was a couple others that were here. We used to just meet one weekly. There was a, a couple others that are no longer here with us that were all part of that. I used to talk. And one of the things we talked about, I remember one time in that is saying, come in, sit in the front and worship. Worship. Enter in and worship, whether you feel like it or not. And one of the things that was said to me, we're not worshiping unless we don't, we don't feel it. Because, because we're not going to be hypocrites. I understand. But see, it isn't feelings. He's worthy of worship whether I feel like it or not. He's worthy of me entering in whether I feel like it or not. I, I, some people, and some people, their whole life of worship is whether they feel it or not. Well, I'm going to tell you this. Most of the time, I don't feel it. I don't. And I'm a feeler. My, my love relationship is touch. And there's sometimes that I don't feel, t- I mean, some, I may, people say I have been touched, but that's a whole other story. But, 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 I, but, but I, don't feel, I don't feel the touch of the Lord all the time on my life. But you have to enter in because of who he is. You have to enter in because you can't live based on on whether you've got the inheritance or not. And all the circumstances are all in your favor. How casual are we in serving Christ? How casual? See, we've been, we've been caught up in a, in a system, and part of the postmodernism of our land, of our world right now, is affecting our way of thinking. It's affecting the way we are and our life of worship. Because we're postmodern people, we can't help it. All of us are affected by postmodernism in our thought. It affects us. And there's a number of different factors that are found in postmodernism. I'm not going to teach on it right now. But one of them is postmodern, in postmodern thought, we want to be, we want to be in control of our own, of our own life. We don't want anyone to tell us what to do. And we want to be able, and, and especially a younger generation affected by postmodernism is, is very, very into their feelings. If I don't feel it, I just don't do it. Well, how's that work for work? tomorrow morning. Don't feel like going. How long are you going to get your job? 
Keep your job. Some of you are going to get up tomorrow morning, and guess what? You are not going to feel like bounding out of bed at 5.30 tomorrow morning, at 4 o'clock, whatever time you got to get up to be at work. You are not going to feel it. I just, oh, I just feel, there's days you do feel good. But there's days you just don't, but you're not going to. But see, it doesn't work there. But that's how we apply it into the church. I just don't feel it when it comes to. The one who's most worthy of our time, talents, ability, worthy of my attention, worthy of my praise, I'm casual with it. Jesus said, it doesn't work that way. Then the last guy is still another said, verse 61. I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. That doesn't sound too bad. But in reality, this person wanted to retain control. When you read the commentators on it, and when you read about the culture, again, this person wasn't just saying, I want to go home, say, Mom and Dad, I'm leaving, pack a duffel bag, and go follow Jesus. This person wanted to go home and get their life in order. They wanted to take care of everything. They wanted to make sure that all of that was in order. And then once they got control of their life, their family, and they got it all in, because kissing goodbye in this culture wasn't just going to, like us, ringing the doorbell at Mom and Dad, saying, see I'm following Jesus it was it was it was getting everything in order in fact this person wanted to maintain control of their own life while they were serving Jesus sound familiar ouch they wanted to have their own life their own their own plans I've got this all figured out, and I've got time for Jesus, and I'm going to put him in here. And so he said, so they said, I'll follow you, but first let me go back, say goodbye, let me get everything in control. And Jesus says to him, you cannot put your hand to the plow and look back, you're not fit for the service, fit for the service in the kingdom of God. You can't have dual interests. Because if you're tied in without letting go, then when you're plowing, if you're plowing the way they plowed, they had to keep their eye on a, on, a, on a plumb line, on a finished spot. And when you plow behind oxen, you have to walk, you have to follow. And if you're t- constantly turning around and have dual interests, you'll wind up running, you'll have your, your plow stuff will be all over the place. And, when, and well, listen, the reason they make straight lines, I'm not a farmer, I've just been told this, the reason they make straight lines and they do all that stuff is so that they can take care of weeds, do the proper irrigation, and make sure that the plant produces the most, better, best crop. So we, we can't have dual interests. So often we're torn in serving the Jesus. A disciple can't, we can't have dual interests. When are we going to lay our lives down and say, I'm going after Jesus. It doesn't matter what it takes. It doesn't matter what it costs me. It doesn't matter. I'm going to show up and I'm going to be there and I'm going to be, I'm going after him. I'm going to follow him. I'm going to everything and my life is given over to him and I'm going to hold nothing back. That's what Jesus was asking. Now, we probably will come back to this text in, a, in the next couple of weeks, because I want to show you how it fits into the whole context of Luke. But I want you to go with me to John chapter 4 right now, and we're going to talk a little bit about this woman at, at the well. John chapter 4, there's a Samaritan woman that comes to the well. I spoke on this a couple of weeks ago, and I I just want to tie this all together on being a disciple about worship, about worship. You see, the next couple of weeks, we're going to be launching a thing here, and we're going to be talking to you about, worship, about, about discipleship. In fact, some, as leaders, we're going to start to, to start looking at ourselves. Where are we as disciples? This is what we're doing. And then what, how does, where are we at in, 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 in making disciples? What does the disciple really look like? This all started because back, back in the first of the year, we, I, we have somebody we brought in to help us, okay, at the church here. We have a coach, okay? And the coach, Steve Smith, coaching us. And one of the things he asked us was, this is where it all started. He said, 
What does a disciple, a New Testament disciple, look like? And he made us list out all the things, the characteristics of a New Testament disciple. And as I listed out all those things, I thought, wait a minute. I'm not, I'm, some of these things I'm not. Then I got to thinking about the people I know, and I start to look and said, we have failed miserably in making New Testament disciples. Not 2017 churchgoers, but New Testament disciples. And it got me thinking. So we're being coached in this and behind. And, and um, only in that we originally, I thought Steve was going to tell us three things to do. We were going to tweak those little things and the church was going to explode into a mega church. Not really. It's not even my heart's desire. But, but we were actually going to see growth. We were going to see some things. And it, it's not like that at all. In fact, it's made me do a lot of self-evaluation as to who I am and who, what am I? Am I really a disciple? And so we're going to be talking more about that, not just preaching it, but we're going to be applying some of these principles, even in small groups and some of the things we're doing. We're going to start seeing more and more, and you're going to get challenged at this place so you can become a disciple. Not even one amen. Wow. Amen. Thank you. Wow. You're all looking at me like deer in headlights right now. The Samaritan woman said to him, verse 9, John 4, John 4, 9, The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that, that is asked you for a drink, you would have asked Him and He would have given you living water. I told you a couple weeks ago, this woman had a call on her life to know Him. A call to know Him. You see, when we live a life of worship, one of the privileges we get to do is we do not worship from afar. We get to worship something that we know. We can experience. We can touch. John chap, 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. John says, that which we told you about in the beginning... He said, he said these things which we have seen, which we have touched, which we have, we have spoken about, this we proclaim to you, that we actually got to touch the Messiah. We're not giving you some abstract, foreign thing. We're talking to you about the reality of touching God. When I'm calling you to, when I say you can become a disciple, I'm calling you to a life of intimately knowing God and touching Him. Knowing who He is, seeing Him, touching Him. In a sense, um, in, a, in a sense of looking at Him, scrutinizing what's going on in your life, looking at yourself and see where you relate to Him, and walking and experience out with the living God. This woman, she was there and he said, if you drank from the water I give you, whew, you would never thirst again. How well do we know him? See, a disciple gets to know who they follow. We get to know the master. Not about him, really know him. Not just about him. Some of us in this room, you could probably name all the characteristics of God if I prompted you a little bit. Oh, the characteristics of God. God is all-powerful, omnipotent. God is omniscient, all-knowing. God is ever-present. He's immutable. If you don't know what that means, you, you know that He never changes. We could quote those things, but do we really know Him? We get the privilege of knowing Him. This woman was called into that place. She was. Then Jesus says in verse 13, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become to them a spring of living water welling up to eternal life. And then I told you, and I've already said this is another point that I've made, is that she was called to make him her life source. Called to make him her life source. Where do you draw your life from? Where do you draw your life from? What do you get your life from? You like, I hope you're not getting your life from the stock market. 
Hope you're not getting your life from the latest uh, headlines on Fox News. I hope it's not. I hope it's not this presidency. I hope it's not the. I, I definitely hope it's not who's going to win the World Series or not. What do we live for? Where are we drawing our life from? What's our life source? Well, see, we're not that shallow, so we wouldn't let those things affect us. We just let things affect us. The worries of life, the people around us. We draw our life from the relationships we have. We draw our life from those things. And some of those are all valent and good and and should be. I mean, God told us to love those around us and, and all those things. But we're not to gain our life from those things. We cannot. Your spouse is not your source of life. Your children should not be the reason that you live. It's Him. It's relationship with Him. I'm drinking from a well that only... I'm drinking out of this relationship with Jesus only He can satisfy. You see, my relationship with Angel will only go as... We, we, can, we can draw from each other, but we are going to fail each other. We're going to let each other down. We're going to do this. But if I'm tapped into Him who will never let me down, who will always satisfy me, who will always be there, then when He fills me up, I can give to her everything she needs. Because my source is not her. My source has been found in a well of living water that comes and flows from the throne room of God. You with me? And it's the same with my children. It's the same in circumstances. It's the same in the world that I live in. So he says to her, I should be your only source. You drink from me, you'll never thirst for anything else. But I don't want to stop there. I want to talk to you about worship. I want to talk to you about a life of worship. So he goes into this, uh, this talk with her, in, and, and she starts to talk about worship. And I want to, I want to read... Um, starting in verse 22, actually 21. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know for salvation is of the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers, read this with me, true worshipers will worship Who? The Father. That's not a big deal to us when we read it. Because we understand God is Father. Remember, the Jews that Jesus was talking to didn't call God Father. Jesus said, you're going to learn to learn to worship. I mean, this was a Samaritan woman, but what I mean is the culture of the day did not look at God as Father. They looked at God as Elohim, as a great, great and awesome God. He was a father to the fatherless, but that was obscure to them. He was a taskmaster. He was rules. He was, he was this God that they saw through their religious eyes. And Jesus comes to reveal the heart of God, of Yahweh, and he says, well, true worshipers are going to worship The Father. The Father. Relationship. The Father. When he taught us to pray in John 6, I mean, um, sorry, Matthew chapter 6, he says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. He started off prayer by again acknowledging the Father. The Father. So he says, the Father is looking. Look what he says. We'll worship the Father, read it with me, in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers who seeks? Seeks. Verse 24. God is spirit. Let's put it up there. Verse 24. Read this with me. God is spirit and If we are going to become worshipers, let's look at one more verse and then we'll go. Okay. Um, Okay, go back to 23. Put 23 back up there. Go backwards. Okay. Just look at the end. For they are the kind of worshipers 
the Father seeks. That word seek is not a word just to look for. It means it's, he is requiring. He's looking in your heart and he's seeing if you're a true worshiper or not. That's why the next verse says, this is what the Father must worship. Must worship. I circle that. When I'm reading my scripture, I'm reading through, I look and I see a word like must. Man, it just jumps out the page at me. What does it mean that I must worship in spirit and in truth? It means it's not just a suggestion. It's not just a good way to worship. It means it's required. It's the only way. If I'm going to be a worshiper, I'm going to have to come in spirit and in truth. We are called to be worshipers. The Father is looking for worshipers. He is searching this room out for a worshiper. He's looking in everything in our hearts to say, is there a worshiper in this house? Angel and I were at the Carolina Revival last weekend. There was, the first night was nice. It was good. It was just a regular kind of a service. It was, it was good. The word was really good, but there wasn't anything. Was super, we, we expect to go in there and just kind of get rolled over by Holy Ghost angels. I mean, angels and the power of God. I mean, it was just, but the second night during the prayer time in the beginning, one of the young pastors got up and he said something that rocked me and it stuck with me all week. He said, I wrote it down. I keep messing it up. I keep asking Angel, are you worshiping? Or I'm going to ask you this way, but, but he said, worship at a level worthy of your story. Yeah. Worship at a level worthy of your story. Right what has he done for you? Do you worship Him at the level that He's touched you? Do you worship Him in such a way that says thank you for every time? Or do we come casually, even in the church, and we talk and say, oh, look at us, oh, look what you have on, oh, you look so nice, oh, and the whole time God's looking for us to go this way. And we live at this level here. Or we get so caught up in what's going on and the kids are this and the family this and all this stuff. And thing. We miss the entire, the entire experience. Are we worshiping at a level that's worthy of the story we can tell of what he's done for us? Where were you? Where would you be apart from Christ? Where would you be today if Jesus didn't touch and change your life? Where would you be? Can we worship him? Do we have to get up and pump and prime and say, come on in the corporate worship. The reason we struggle corporately is because our private worship struggles. Because this is only an expression of what we are privately before the Lord. And if you struggle in the corporate worship, you're probably not having any life of worship and nothing in the private place because then you can't out. Because this is the overflow of what you have privately. And we struggle in that private place of worship. Are you living a life that's worthy of the story that will be told in glory for what He did for you? There was a woman that that came in to a house of a Pharisee. He he was, he was healed, probably healed of leprosy, or, or somehow he was, he was known as Simon the leper, but he, wasn't lep- he didn't have leprosy. So maybe he was healed, but he's there somehow in this place. This woman comes in, and she begins, she takes an alabaster box, the most expensive thing she owned on earth, and she broke it at the feet of Jesus, and she worships as the room is filled with the perfume. And the Pharisee looks down and goes, Jesus knew what type of woman this was. He would never let her touch him. What if the woman would have looked up at that moment and said, if you only knew what he did for me, you would not judge me right now. Because I was lost. 
But now I'm found. And I was living in a hole. And I, I'd given myself over to all kinds of lovers and all types of things. And I might have had a reputation. But I found someone who loves me where I am that cares and, 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 and accepts me. And is willing to give himself up. And I'm going to hold nothing back. I'm here to worship. The Father's looking for a worshiper. He's looking for someone that will worship. The NIV says, in the Spirit. It's not correct. NIV translation. All the other translations have it right. It's not capital S, it's small s, worship in spirit. It means that my spirit, deep, calls to deep. My spirit connects with the Spirit of God. The only way you're going to be able to worship is you've got to. What does it mean to worship in the Spirit? I'm a spirit man. I'm made, I'm, I'm a tri, I'm made of three things, right? I'm body, soul, and spirit. My body can follow. My soul, the soulish realm, is the mind, will, and emotions. Most people never function outside of their soulish realm. We live in our mind, what our mind can think up or contrive or understand. We live in the, in the mind, in our will, what we will do or what we can. We think that serving God is just a matter of disciplines. That's not necessarily true. There are some, but that's not necessarily true. And then the emotion, whether we feel it or we don't, or we're up or we're down. We're not to worship God in the soulish realm. The soul will follow if we worship God in spirit. My spirit man, you never have seen me. You only see the shell that I live in. I'm a spirit man. I have a body. I have a soul that, that takes what the Spirit does and it, it, it projects it and it, it interacts with others and it, it, it does my soulish realm, my mind, will, and emotions. But, but really, I'm a spirit man and that spirit has to connect with God. Jesus says, I'm looking for, the Father's looking for someone who will worship that their spirit, who we are deep inside, will connect with who He is. And nothing, nothing will get between us. And then also in truth. That word truth isn't just being right. It's talking about being pure. See, there's some people, see, religion will allow you to be right, but not be righteous. Religion will allow you to be right, but not be righteous. You can be right, and you can stand in judgment of the person sitting right next to you. And you can be right about that they've got some problems and some things, but they may be worshiping in a righteous way. And as you stand there and you look over and go, how can they worship like that? You might be right, but you are not righteous. But Jesus says the Father's looking for someone who will worship in truth. That'll be real. Real. That's truth. Be the same all the way through. That's truth. Not this outward, put it on, put on the church smile, put on the nice stuff, put on the nice little clothes and go in and go, Hallelujah, my God reigns. Being real. Being truthful, being honest with yourself, honest with God. He says, I'm looking for somebody that'll worship me that way. In this place, in this house, I'm searching. My eyes are running. Second Chronicles 16, 9. The eyes of the Lord go to and fro, searching and looking for those whose hearts are fully committed to him. I'm looking for a heart. I'm looking, I'm looking. There's a searchlight on over here. The searchlight comes on each one of us. Poof, poof, poof. Can I find a heart of a worshiper? Can I find somebody? The Father's looking. Now how do we worship? We worship in three ways, just real quickly. And, and we'll, we'll go, we'll have the worship team come and we'll go on to communion and we'll do our thing. You worship from your heart. You worship from your heart. In the Bible, it tells us that we are to love the Lord our God with all our hearts, mind and soul, right? We worship out of our hearts. 
In their day, in their time, when they wrote about the heart, they thought that the heart was the center of the being. Because when your heart stopped, you died, and they didn't understand. We, now, scientifically, we understand that they can artificially keep the heart going and his brain waves and all those things, okay? But the truth of the matter is, when they're saying, when it says that we have to have a heart of worship, it's talking about that we, the very center of who we are yeah. is given over to the Lord. Yeah, are you giving your heart to him? Have you given your life to him? A worshiper lays down their life for the one they worship. It's been said, you can tell how spiritual someone is and how full of life of worship they are by looking at their checkbook. Because what we spend our money on and what we give ourselves to shows what we truly worship. But I won't say that. I just said someone else said that, so I get off the hook. You can't blame me for that one. But when the Father turns the spotlight on us, what does He see? Does He see the heart of a worshiper? Does He see that your heart is committed to Him? Does He see that He's searching out, looking for that heart that loves Him, that goes after Him, a heart that, 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 that is given over to him. A heart that's poured out and said, I have my heart beats for one thing. David said something like this in Psalm 27, 4. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek after. That I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. I live for one thing, David said. I've got riches. I'm a, I'm a king. I have people who serve me. I've got a great army. I've got wives. I've got children. I've got family. I've got heritage. I've got legacy. I've got everything you can imagine. I've got victories like Goliath and other kings and other that have fallen at my feet. But I'm going to tell you this. There's one thing I live for, and that's him. And nothing, nothing, nothing is going to get between me and him. Yeah. My heart beats yeah. for one thing. What does your heart beat for? What does your heart beat for? The second thing we worship with is the three T's. We worship, um, well, for, with. We worship God with the three T's. Our time, our talents, and our treasures. Our time, greatest commodity we have is our time. If you struggle with the devotional life, it's a time issue. It's a heart issue that's a time issue. Because you make the time to do the things you love to do. Amen. We all do. We all make. We, only have, we All of us only have 24 hours a day. We have so many times the Bible tells us to number our days. You might try to do that one time. The older you get, the lower that number comes, and it gets scary. But are we giving him our time? Do you give him time? Do you acknowledge him in all your ways? Do you give him time? Do you give him time in prayer? Do you give him time in worship? Do you give him time in the Word? Or are you too busy for him? Have you filled your life with other things that don't allow your life to be a life of worship? Because oftentimes we do. We fill our lives. Now, there's seasons in our life sometimes that that happens with. There's a demand on our life. All of a sudden, we've got to work extra hours. We've got to do travel comes. There's certain things that are seasonal in our life. But it shouldn't be the norm of our life. It shouldn't be the norm of our life. If you're too busy for God, you're too busy. But what about our talents? Have you given him your talents, your abilities? Are you using them for God? Are you honoring him for them? Are you blessing the Lord? Are you building his kingdom? Are you giving yourself over to the purposes and plan of God? Are you doing that in, in, in giving yourself over? Because you, every one of us have abilities and talents and, and we have different things. And yet we, we consume oftentimes on ourselves. They, they become what we want. So it's our time. It's our talents. 
There might be a need. You might say, I can work with my hands. I'm willing to give several hours to go help somebody with what I can do. I can do this. I can give my time. Oh man, I, I know about, I can, you know what? I know computers really well. Maybe I could, I can bless in this way and give. There's certain talents, whether it's working with your hands or working with your mind or whatever it is. God has blessed you with a certain bends and certain abilities and certain things. Are those things being spent for God or are they being spent on yourself? But then there's also the treasures we have, the things that are most important to us. It's not just our monies, but it includes our monies. Because the hours we spend at work get translated into dollars, which are every hour we spent, we get translated into money. And then what we do with that money, what we do with that is, is all part of it. What are we willing? Are we givers rather than takers? Are we willing to give ourselves? Are we after certain things? Is that what we're really we're after? Because Jesus says where your treasure is, that's where you're going to find your heart. And it comes all the way back to the heart issue again. See, if you really love God, we shouldn't have to say, you know what, the church has a need. Shouldn't. In fact, we should learn to be able to give over and above it. Some people, we just, you know, I could teach you on tithing. I can do that. But oftentimes, the best teaching on tithing, let me say this right, okay? You will get blessed when you tithe. But if I just teach you on tithing and tell you the whole time you're going to get blessed, then all I'm doing is basically feeding your desire to be blessed So the reason you'll invest 10% in the church coffers is so that you can be blessed and the other 90% can be blessed and be favored of God. We should give just because. Just because. We love Him. We give. Not just out of a need. Not just because there's a need. We just give. Because he gave. That's the way it is. And then lastly, worship team, you can come, please. As our worship comes out of our life. This is the disciplines. This is where we always talk about being a disciple and you have the right disciplines in your life. But I'm going to tell you, if your heart is given over to the purposes of God in worship, If you're giving him your time, your talents, and your treasures, then your life will easily follow. But if I tell you all the disciplines, you see this, if you really, really love Jesus, you won't have trouble spending time in worship. If your heart is really given over to the purposes of God, we don't... The disciplines that we all teach, there's certain disciplines we need in our life. But to live out the disciplines just is a religious expression without the heart involved in it. And there's some people that do the motions, but they don't have the life. So how we live is an expression of worship. How I live, how I live, my attitudes towards people, my relationships, the way I act towards people is an expression of my heart attitude towards God and worship. I cannot love God without loving people. It's just His natural overflow. I cannot love Jesus. I cannot say I'm a lover of Jesus and then walk around and not love people because the natural overflow of loving God is to love people. The life of disciplines in my life, my prayer life, my time of worship, the time in God's Word, the time, the disciplines of my life, of me, even, you can say, you know what, you shouldn't say that, you got to, Put, a, put, a, put a, a guard on your tongue. Guess what? If you lived a life of worship, you wouldn't have to guard your tongue. Because the life of worship will automatically put a guard on your tongue. Nothing evil could come out of your mouth if you're living a life of worship. And when you see evil coming out of your mouth, then you immediately understand that that's going back to a worship issue. And you deal with it people relationships if we're struggling with relationships we're always angry or this person here this thing here i i see that sometimes around here i see people who really truly love god but then we can't get along with people there's all this agitation with people it's because there's a 
problem in the secret place. Because in the secret place is where my life has changed to love and to care for people, to give myself to those around me, to lovingly, caringly give myself away. Believe me, woman, a time is coming, it is now here, when true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. This is the type of worshipers the Father seeks, those who worship in spirit and truth. To be a disciple, we're called to be a life of worship. It's what a disciple does. In fact, it's a giving over ourselves. When we move towards this baptism, one of the things we're going to look at in doing so is laying down all the things in the baptism water that keeps us from worship. What is it that has to go in the water? Some of our lives, we've been baptized, but we didn't leave some of the stuff in the water like it was supposed to be left in. So we went under and we picked it back up. You went under, but you brought your family with you. You went under, but your wallet stayed with you. You went under, but your, but your, but your desire for self and your self-worth didn't stay in the water. It came up, so your insecurities are still running rampant in your life. All those things have to die. We leave it in the water. And we come up on the other end. See, when the Israelites went into, when they went after, the Israelites came out of Egypt, when they went through the waters and they came up on the other side, every thing, every enemy of Egypt drowned in the waters. There wasn't one chariot that came out on the other side. We lay our lives down. Say, here's my life of worship. 